morning to the First Apostolic Church of, Dozen, of Dublin family and any visitors we may have. Hope everyone's been able to enjoy Independence Day. I uh, thank God for this country, and we certainly have our challenges before us, especially these days, but uh, still no place I would rather be, and I, I thank the Lord uh, for this country. Now, the title of today's lesson is What the Lord Requires with our key scripture coming from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. We'll go ahead and get started. And the scripture reads, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit, of my, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. In other words here, uh, basically coming from the standpoint of, well, will this sacrifice, will this, will this get God's attention, the sacrifices that we give? So then what I really want to draw our attention to is verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So we're going to talk about this uh, key scripture today in Micah 6, uh, verse 8, of what the Lord requires of us uh, back then and today. So <clears throat> from, the, from the start of this, it's to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly uh, with thy God. So we'll start talking about doing justly. Proverbs 11.1 1 says that a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So the background on this is, is about having uh, rigged weights for commerce, weights that uh, probably read heavy when you're selling and they read light uh, when you're buying to the advantage of the... Uh, to the one with the with the scales, so <clears throat> sometimes I think we hear scriptures like this for so long and so much um, that we forget about the practical application. So we'll we'll dive into this a little bit because uh, basically God demands that we be on the up and up. Because what we're really talking about here is cheating and stealing, plain and simple. Um, so I actually found nine scriptures about just weights uh, in the Bible. And there, there could be more. I just happened to find nine of them. So in Leviticus 19 and, and 36 says, just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hen shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So no... Uh, no room for any other interpretation. The Lord says, this, this is what you shall have, are, are just weights and balances. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, furthermore, Proverbs 16.11 says, a just weight and balance are the Lord's, and all the weights of the bag are his work. A couple of other translations, uh, a couple of other versions translate that differently instead of at the end of that being all the weights in the bag or his work are they translate that to be his concern I kind of like that translation but so really what they're saying is um, you know it's God's business okay he is he is concerned about it he does care about that that's the NASB in the Holman Bible by the way um, both translate as, as his concern but the bottom line about this is God cares uh, that we do things justly. So the bottom line here is that um, God requires us to be examples of honesty, honesty and integrity in how we live our day-to-day -day lives and how we do business in this world. Uh, we have to be examples of being upright. Now, most of us don't use weights and balances in our day-to-day -day dealings. Uh, I'm sure a few do. We, we do have a whole, we have whole divisions and, and 
government related to that, and if you're in some sort of manufacturing, you may you may deal with uh, weights and balances of this sort that have to do with commerce. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, you know, we do, we do pay taxes, <clears throat> or at least we better. <laughs> uh, Matthew 22 and 21 says in part, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Jesus specifically talking about taxes. So, to kind of get to the practical application side of this, let's look at it this way. Uh, I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is, is, have we ever written something off as a business expense that was actually a personal expense? If we have, that's an abomination to the Lord, just like a false weight in the balance. That's not dealing justly. It's not about whether or not you get caught. It's about right and wrong. Even if the IRS can't track it, and there's no chance of you getting proved to be wrong, we need to be completely upright and transparent uh, in our business dealings and other things in our lives. Um, another point on this subject is you don't have to agree with the tax code to abide by it. It's the law of the land. Uh, God requires us to abide by it, just like stop signs and speed limits. Unless the law is contrary to God and his word, we are to obey it. Uh, of course, that's another whole Bible study and not what we're the focus of today. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying is don't complain if you get a, a traffic violation, a ticket. Uh, rather, you should reflect upon the fact that you weren't following the law of the land and uh, not blame the one giving you the ticket. So we'll move on quickly from <laughs> <laughs> from this. But getting back to doing justly, um, we've talked about dealing uprightly and honestly in business, but also Proverbs 11 and verse 1 says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. So again, there's that word abomination again. Very, very strong words here. Uh, but they that deal truly are his delight. So we're required to tell the truth all the time. So let me let me qualify this <laughs> this last statement. Um, we are certainly required to be honest and to tell the truth, but that doesn't mean that we can't be kind. For example, if your wife tries out a new recipe and asks you if you like it, it's okay to be kind, even if you're not crazy about it. See my a little story here. My my grandmom grandmother on my mom's side, Grandma Scott, uh, she was what you might call a brutally honest person. And she had a way of responding to questions like that. And her response would be, I can eat it. <laughs> she, uh, she wouldn't say she liked it. She wouldn't say this is horrible. <laughs> she, wanted, she did not want to be dishonest and say that she liked it. Uh, but she would say, I can eat it, and, you know, she wouldn't say that with a lot of excitement, so you, you definitely got the message. So uh, that's a <laughs> uh, that's just the way that she responded to it. And while it was a true statement, I'm not so sure it was kind, the way she, uh, the way she delivered that. So I've adopted a, a statement in these situations that my dad uses. So when my wife asked me, how do you like it? If I really don't, I say, it's not bad. You know, I've heard my dad say that for years, and mom would roll her eyes. So now, <laughs> I've, I've tried that with my wife, and the response I got was, so what you're really saying is that it's not good. <laughs> so, so my response to that was, okay, I guess we're in agreement here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was able to make that a, uh, a comical situation, but all joking aside, God does require us uh, to speak the truth. Colossians 3 and 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Furthermore, Ephesians 4 and 25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
And lastly, uh, Psalm 51, 7 says, lets us know that, or rather, that uh, God desires truth in the inward parts. In this particular setting in Psalm 51, David is had just repented for uh, his great sin with Bathsheba. And uh, we always need to remember that even when we make huge mistakes, the, that we can get right with God through heartfelt repentance. And this is what David was doing in this setting when then he talked about God desiring truth in the inward parts. And uh, that truth in the inward parts is in place when we do justly. That's one of the things uh, that helps accomplish that. Uh, we are honest in deed and in word. We're doing justly. So as Christians, our world... Our word, rather, uh, should be as good as gold, and better, actually, better than gold. Um, the old saying that a man is as good as his word applies. If we say one thing and do another, we're just like people that don't know the Lord. Uh, but we've been transformed by him. By his grace and mercy, we can have a clean heart and truth in the inward parts, which brings us to the next section, going back to... Uh, Micah chapter 6. The Lord also requires us to love mercy. This one, you know, it's the, it's the very heartbeat of a believer is mercy. It's uh, God's grace and his mercy showered upon us by the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the gospel. It's the good news. Um, it's the very essence of our faith. Quite simply, it's what we believe and what we build our faith and our lives upon. There is no salvation without God's mercy. So we need to love mercy. So lots of scriptures on mercy uh, in the word. God's mercy, on God's mercy, on us having mercy, on us showing mercy. And But today, I'd like for us to focus for a few minutes on Matthew 18, uh, verses 21 to 30, 35. It's a fairly uh, lengthy portion of Scripture, not really conducive to this online format uh, for lessons. So I'm just going to attempt to paraphrase as we go through this. And this is the parable of the unforgiving servant. So basically, the Apostle Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness specifically how many times he should forgive someone that sins against him. And he throws out a number he feels like he's being fairly generous with, seven times. It's more than the others that were in the group that they were, were having a discussion. And I'm assuming Peter feels like he's being fairly generous with this, uh, with this seven. So Jesus replies, you're not even close, uh, 70 times seven. And remember, I, I'm paraphrasing here. So basically, Jesus is just saying, you know, don't keep track. Freely forgive. Don't keep a running tab of offenses. You know, and then he goes on, Jesus goes on to tell a story about a king that had a servant that had a tremendously huge debt um, that, of course, he was unable to pay. And it was the time for judgment, his day of reckoning. Uh, the servant fell on his face and begged for more time, and the king was so moved uh, by that plea that he forgave the debt entirely. If the story ended there, we could say it was a happy ending, right? Well, there's a little more of the story. Then that same servant that was forgiven of that massive debt by the king went to a friend of his, which owed him a very small debt. When the friend begged for more time, the king's servant would not listen, and he had him cast into prison. The king eventually hears about this, and when he found out what had happened, he brought judgment against that unforgiving servant. Jesus then states um, that he will also be judged this way if we can't forgive trespasses, those that we will be judged if we can't forgive those that trespass against us. Very powerful story about the necessity of forgiveness. And I'm reminded of... Um, what Bishop Collins has taught over the years, that unforgiveness is not a word. 
in the English language. But bitterness is. So your choices are basically forgiveness or bitterness. If we don't forgive, we become bitter. So doing a little bit of a word search, uh, the antonym or opposite of forgiveness is ruthlessness, is, is one, of, one of the opposites, one of the antonyms. And another one, quite interestingly, is mercilessness. Uh, God help us forgive. We need to be wed ready to quickly forgive as God has forgiven us. We need to love mercy. Loving forgiveness is loving mercy. Luke 6, verses 36 and 37, clearly states that, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Interesting fact here. People don't earn forgiveness. Forgiveness is granted by the one that's giving the forgiveness with the heart of mercy. If you're waiting to forgive someone until they've earned it, you're not likely to ever forgive that person. Another interesting tidbit. Forgiving is a decision. Likewise, we are not to wait for someone to ask us to forgive them. We are just supposed to forgive freely. And it is true that in God's plan of salvation, uh, he requires repentance. But we are not God. So when someone has offended us, we are just to freely forgive. Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2 says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Strong words, because what this is telling us is that if we are harsh in judging others, we're going to be judged harshly. If we're kind and merciful, we're going to receive the same there as well. So God will treat us the way we treat others. And it's so much easier <laughs> to be merciful and to quickly forgive offenses. That's loving mercy. So let's take a look at what are some signs that we, aren't, that we are not loving mercy. Let's kind of dig into this a little bit deeper. When we catch ourselves saying things like, yeah, they finally got what they deserved. It's about time. If we're at all happy when something bad happens to someone, beware. That's not loving mercy. When we see a brother or a sister taken in a fault and we can't wait to share the news with others, it's not loving mercy. If we can't accept someone into the body of believers because of something in their past, a mistake that they made in the past, that's not loving mercy. In fact, when we do this, we're saying that the blood of Jesus Christ is not able to redeem. In fact, we're going on further. What we're really saying when we do this is that we have higher standards than God. This is dangerous ground, and if we have these things in our heart, we need to hit our knees and make it right with God. We're all just sinners saved by the grace of God. The blood of Jesus Christ levels the playing field. None of us are good enough. None of us have earned it. In and of ourselves, we do not deserve it. We all need his forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy. We need to be honest with ourselves. And when we do this, we will be humbled, which brings us to the next section of our lesson. Walk humbly with thy God, is what the word says. 
The Lord requires us to walk humbly with him. 1 Peter 5 and 5 tells us that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I don't want God to resist me. You know, and the best way to do that uh, is to be humble. God gives grace to the humble. And I know I need his grace. I'm far from perfect. Just ask anyone that knows me. If my wife was here today, she would, I'd probably get an amen, I'm sure. <laughs> probably not, but she should be giving an amen at that, I would say. I'm joking. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace given me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, there's a mouthful, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So soberly or of a right mind, you know, be real. Uh, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. We all know ourselves. We know we have limitations. We know we have faults. We know we have challenges. So we need to keep these things in mind and not place ourselves higher than we should be. And I'm just going to say this, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll hit it quickly and move on. Um, what, we see, what do we see in the political world right now? Um, two very extreme sides. And I'm going to say this, and this is just my personal opinion, both sides completely and totally lack humility. Both sides are so sure of themselves with no recognition of God. But here's what the word says. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 9, verses 22, or I'm sorry, 23 and 24, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glorieth in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. The Lord delights in our recognition of him, that he is in control and that we are not. And acknowledging that his ways are perfect and right. If we are wise, he gave us the wisdom. If we are mighty, he gave us the power. If we are rich, he provided the riches. Our final scripture is Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place for my rest, of my rest? For all these things hath my hand made, and all those things hath been, saith the Lord. Or in other words, God's not impressed with any building that we can construct for him, and it's not going to contain the Almighty. But the latter portion of this scripture is what I want to draw our attention to this morning. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. When we are humble and not full of ourselves, God looks to us because this pleases him. And when we tremble at his word, that means we're going to do his word. If it's in the book, if it's in the word, then we need to abide by it. You know, there's something about being in God's presence that humbles us. I'm not going to take the time to look up the scriptures this morning. Uh, but Isaiah 6 tells us about an experience the prophet Isaiah had when he came into God's presence. In verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe is me, I am undone. I am a mess. When he came into contact with the holy God, he realized he was not so holy and not so righteous. When Daniel was face to face with 
face to face with one of God's angels, he put it this way in Daniel 10, uh, verse 8. My comeliness, or my beauty and majesty, uh, was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Getting into God's presence changes us. Getting into God's presence is reality check for us. When we are in God's presence, we will be humble because we are reminded of who he is and who we are in relation to him. So it's easy to be humble when we walk closer to him, and we do that by having a strong prayer life. So maybe if we find ourselves struggling with humility and perhaps being overconfident, we need to have an encounter with Jesus. We need to draw closer to him. So in closing, to go over the main points of the lesson, uh, God requires us to do justly. We accomplish this by living an honest life by always telling the truth and being true to our own words, by being upright in, in all things, including business and even taxes, and not just when it's convenient. The true measure of a man or woman of God is what they do and how they live when there's no fear or chance of being caught, because a true man or woman of God knows that God knows all things. But at some point, Living an upright life isn't about avoiding negative consequences of doing otherwise of our actions. It's about wanting to live a life that's pleasing to him. When, that's, when that relationship is to the point with the Lord where we want to live a life that's pleasing to him, um, that's really where things are meant to go. It's not about the negative consequences, uh, but that's why we should be living uprightly. God also requires us to love mercy. The entire Christian faith is built upon God's mercy, which is applied by the blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Those of us that have received mercy need to also give mercy to others. To love mercy is to love the works of God and how he saves us. We need to delight in people being delivered from sin and bondage and receiving mercy. Who are we to judge someone God has pardoned? If it's under the blood, if it's under his blood, we need to leave it there. And that's precious. And we all need it. Forgiveness is a decision, and we can't wait for those that have offended us to ask for forgiveness. We have a, we have a divorce care ministry here at First Apostolic Church of Dublin, and one of the lessons in that 13-week uh, course is dedicated to forgiveness. And uh, so I kind of want to give them the credit for this analogy, but... They tell the story of comparing holding a grudge is like keeping someone in a jail cell. So you're the guard, and they're in the jail cell. And the reality of that is, is that you're both in the jail. And the only way you keep them in that cell is if you're on the other side guarding it. So you're in just as bad a shape as the person you're trying to hold in the, in the jail cell for something. And the other flip side of that is sometimes folks don't even know that they've done something that has offended you. So they're out living their life and not having any issues while you're still standing at that cell trying to hold them in there, trying to be the warden in the prison because you're, you're still in the prison at that point. So forgiveness is uh, is something that should not be taken lightly and it should be freely, freely given and not earned. God requires us to walk humbly with him. 
1 Peter 5, 5 tells us that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We don't want to be resisted. We want to, uh, we want to, we want to have God's grace in our lives. The Lord delights in our recognition of him, that he is in control and that we are not, and that his ways are perfect. Even when it seems like there's so much turmoil going on in this world, in, our, in these present times, the realization and the acknowledgement that God is in control, that's an anchor to our souls, and it's also something that delights the Lord. Being in God's presence humbles us. The more time we spend with God in prayer, the easier it is for us to walk humbly with him. This concludes our lesson for today. Uh, thank you for your time. God bless you all. Thank you.